Welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. We aim to bring you the best macro analysis to help you successfully invest in financial markets. For our latest analysis, visit macrohive.com. We've been busy bees at MacroHive. This week, we released our new monthly asset allocation update, where we give our views on equities, bonds, and other asset classes in a world of growing recessionary risks. On crypto, there's a lot of buzz around the upcoming Ethereum merge, where Ethereum switches from proof of work to proof of stake. We give our take on what this means. We have a guest writer who talks about what happens to equities if they have a poor Q1. We give our latest US recession probabilities. And then on the educational side, we have an explainer on fertilizer prices and an academic summary on the latest thinking on whether long-term interest rates will remain structurally low. And that's just our output from this week alone. To get access to all of these insights, simply become a member at macrohive.com. With membership, you can get access to all of our updates, webinars, transcripts, and our member Slack room, where you can interact with the Macrohive research team and know the members all hours of the day. Membership to Macrohive costs the same as a few weekly cappuccinos, so go to macrohive.com to sign up now. And if you're a professional or institutional investor, we have a more high-octane product that features all of my and the MacroHive research team's views, our model portfolio, trade ideas, machine learning models, and much, much more. Hit me up on Bloomberg or email me on bilal at macrohive.com. That's bilal, B-I-L-A-L at macrohive.com to find out more. Now, a word from the sponsors of this episode, Masterworks. Are you worried about inflation? Perhaps you should be. Every month, inflation is reaching new highs, 6.2%, 6.5%, and most recently, 7.2% in the US. That's how much more food, electricity, and housing is costing these days. And if you're anything like us, now may be time to consider alternatives. Why alternatives? Well, for starters, a survey last year conducted by Motley Fool revealed that ultra-high net worth investors had 50% of their portfolio in alternatives on average. We're talking about portfolios valued at over $1 billion. But one alternative that nobody seems to be talking about is fine art. That's because up until now, you've had to have millions to own fine art. But that's not the case anymore. Thanks to Masterworks, they let you purchase shares that represent an investment in famous artworks. Pieces from masters like Warhol and Banksy at a more approachable price point. You can go to masterworks.io forward slash macro to skip the line and join over 300,000 members already on Masterworks. That's masterworks.io forward slash macro. See important regulation aid disclosures and the offering circular at masterworks.io at masterworks.io forward slash about forward slash disclosure. Now onto this episode's guest, Josh Young. Josh is the chief investment officer and founder of Bison Interests, an investment firm that focuses on publicly traded oil and gas sectors an investment firm that focuses on the publicly traded oil and gas sector. He has over 15 years of experience in investment management, 10 of which were focused on publicly traded oil and gas securities. Josh became the chairman of the board of RMP Energy in 2017 after refreshing the board and management team and rebranding the company to Ironbridge Resources. It was bought out at a 78% premium in 2018. Before this, Josh was a management consultant to Fortune 500 companies and private equity firms, and then an investment analyst at a private equity fund. Josh also worked as an investment analyst for a multi-billion dollar single family office. Now, on to our conversation. So welcome, Josh. It's great to have you on the podcast. I've been looking forward to having you on for a while now. Thank you for having me on. Great. Now, before we go into the meat of our conversation, I always like to ask my guests something about their origin story. You know, where did you go to university or school? What did you study? Was it inevitable you'd end up in commodities and energy? And, uh, you know, what's been your, your journey until now? So, so I'm from Los Angeles, the LA area. Um, so uh, the logical path there is to go into real estate or in entertainment. And, you know, I like real estate, but I felt like by the time I was coming out of school, the, the real estate bubble and real estate prices have been elevated for some time. And, you know, they've gone up since then, but if, I figured that wasn't so interesting. Um, so I went to the University of Chicago and studied economics and um, did a series of kind of the normal progression, I guess it's considered from econ or finance background. I did management consulting and then private equity and then worked for a multi-billion dollar uh, asset manager, single family office. And then, um, you know, uh, did a a combination of, I launched a small subscale hedge fund that didn't work out and um, did a number of uh, one-off sort of event-driven or opportunistic energy investments. 
and I, which I had done at that family office and I had done previously just kind of personally. And in 2015, after the oil price crash, I set up a fund with a partner and we, um, we figured we'd make a fund out of uh, this sort of set of one-off investments. It turns out if you do one-off investments and you do four right and they're great, and then the fifth one isn't so great, uh, people don't want to do the sixth one with you anymore, <laughs> even though on average your record's great. So the solution was, hey, let's have 10 or 20 positions on at a time. And in this much more volatile environment, after the big commodity run up, um, there was a lot more opportunity and it made sense to have a basket instead of just one or two things. And so that's what I do and kind of how I got to what I do. Great. And, and you know, the company you, uh, you founded is Bison Interests. Um, why, why Bison? That's uh, uh, an interesting name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the bison is, um, I mean, it's an iconic kind of Western uh, symbol. And, you know, it's iconic for different reasons. Um, one, one reason that really resonated with us and that I think is particularly, it's, it's working particularly well um, now that oil prices have started to rise and the strategy is working over time and has worked actually since inception now, which is pretty cool. Um, the bison is the only four-legged animal that when there's a storm, it faces into the storm and it gets through it safer and faster. The other animals, they when there's a storm coming, they turn and they run away. And so, you know, the other energy investors that were doing what we were doing and many that were doing different things mostly closed up. And so um, over the last seven years since we launched our fund, and so, you know, the competitive space has really dwindled. So it actually, I guess, was kind of prophetic or a prediction about what, what would happen. And here we are and, you know, um, things, things are working really well. So, so I think there's a lot of benefit to kind of, it seems stubborn and sometimes foolish in the midst of a storm to be facing into it, but that's, that's where our name came from. And it's, it's turned out to be a pretty good name. No, that's great. That's great. I didn't, I had no idea that that, that was a case with license. Uh, so that's a great story. Um, and, you know, you, you talked about making a basket of investments. Um, so when you say investments, what types of investments are we talking about? So, so we only invest in publicly traded companies okay. and we focus on upstream producers of oil, natural gas and natural gas liquids. And then occasionally we'll buy stock in either midstream, it's like infrastructure sort of uh, companies generally related to the oil and gas industry or services companies. So companies essentially on the value chain that help get oil out of the ground or natural gas out of the ground or processed or sort of there's a whole, there's a giant industry ecosystem around that, that I think is very poorly understood. And actually recently we've been doing a lot more of that because um, because it's so poorly understood and because uh, there are some advantages from what we've been focusing on in terms of knowing kind of who's winning next as this commodity cycle unfolds. And, and so when you talk about upstream, midstream, and I presume downstream, can you just elaborate a bit what, what, what the key types of things that happen at each part of the stream, just for the benefit of our listeners and also myself as well, in case I've missed something here? Yeah, for sure. So we actually really don't do much refining, which is downstream. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we will on occasion, but it's really not been a focus so far for the fund. Um, so upstream is basically the company that owns, that acquires the mineral rights to the land, the, the rights to extract minerals from land, whether it's through government or through a private uh, land owner or mineral right owner. So they essentially lease or acquire the rights to the petroleum with some royalty or some other sort of terms. So upstream is the company that owns it and pays for it or owns the lease to it and pays to get it developed and then generates the cash flow from the sale of the commodity. So that's the upstream company. A midstream company is a company that gathers that commodity and profit processes it. So in some cases, the, the pipe up to the well or the pipe up to the field um, is not owned by the producer, it's owned by the midstream company and then processes it and then delivers it to a refinery or delivers it if it's gas to a gas, uh, I guess they might own the gas processing plant too and maybe delivers it to an interstate pipeline. The midstream company might also own that interstate pipeline and then deliver that gas either to industrial users or power plants or to utilities that then distribute it out. 
um, the, this natural gas. And then you know, there's various other sort of midstream related to natural gas liquids. And then services are companies that own drilling rigs or own drill bits or provide technical services to uh, companies to help them figure out where to drill or uh, to help manage the drilling or to manage pressure pumping, fracking. Um, you know, there's a whole kind of uh, set of different services that go into development. And it's one of the things I think people don't really understand so much about oil and gas is the producers. So uh, Congress just called a bunch of producers to testify about gasoline prices. So yeah. ironically, they called companies that don't produce gasoline to talk about gasoline prices, um, which was uh, one aspect that was interesting. <laughs> but a bigger aspect is they don't really seem to understand if you go to a well site or you go to where people are drilling or where they're fracking and you look around at the people who are there, almost none of them are employed. So if it's an Exxon well site, almost none of them are employed by Exxon. They're employed by, you know, a drilling company and then a oil services company like a, so it might be like neighbors or a Helmer campaign uh, might be, uh, you know, there might be people from that drilling contractor. There might be people from Halliburton or Schlumberger or Baker Hughes or Weatherford kind of helping supervise the drilling process and providing specialty services. There might be, um, American Energy Services or one of these other sort of chemical companies with people there delivering drilling chemicals or, or fracking chemicals and mud and other stuff. There might be sand companies, uh, sand company people there either okay. facilitating delivery. Anyway, I'm, I'm kind of rambling, but that's a, there's this whole set of people who are there and there might be like two people from Exxon or I mean, Exxon, I don't know, they tend to overstaff their stuff, but from a XYZ upstream producer, you might only have two people. If there's 200 people at the site or hundred people at the site, you might only have a few from the actual company that owns it. And the rest are people that are contractors and uh, either employed by service companies or contractors to service employees. Uh, kind of like you own a house, you're getting it built, right? You might show up or you might hire someone on your behalf to show up. And then you have all these contractors and subcontractors and whatever that are there to build your house. And so you say people don't understand this as much. I can understand politicians not understanding this and the general public, but surely investors in this sector would understand this. But is, is that not the case? I mean, frankly, I, and there aren't many professional investors that focus <laughs> on oil and gas as specialists anymore in business or okay. employment. Um, so <laughs> uh, what they understand, I, I don't know, because there's not many left. So. <laughs> I think as a generalist investor looking at something like this, it's quite challenging because there's a lot of different dynamics at play. And I just don't, I mean, I think, I think there's some understanding of drilling rigs in terms of you buy a onshore offshore rig for X and it costs, you know, two X to replace it. So it's interesting as a value proposition, as a value investor, or you buy a pressure pumping company which you know they're a little more expensive on replacement costs, but they're generating cash flow. So you buy it for three times cash flow, and you think it's worth five. Um, so there's a little bit of that, but I think there's a lot of kind of missing understanding of the steps that are required, as well as which aspects are less well supplied and which ones are more well supplied. Um, there's really not much. There used to be this whole kind of set of research providers that would help you figure out who's doing what when and a lot of those people a lot of those businesses are either not in business anymore they've been folded into larger companies and those services have kind of diminished and so um you know for example there's been this thesis for a while that pressure pumping so the fracking providers that that's been undersupplied and that drilling rigs were widely available and it's turned out it was kind of the opposite so the pressure pumpers the, they got better margins early, but there's actually much more of a shortage of staffed functional drilling rigs than there is of pressure pumpers. And so we're seeing this crazy move right now of drilling rig companies way outperforming the pressure pumping companies from a share price perspective from this thing that you could see. I mean, we put out a white paper in January. We were late, right? People were talking about this two or three months before. I mean, we were talking about it. We just hadn't published our research. Um, so th that's what I mean. There's there's things that you could tell if you were paying attention. And it's just the whole research space and the whole investment space has been eviscerated. And so you can kind of, you can be so early that it almost looks like you're wrong because the stocks, like the fundamentals are there. It just it takes six months sometimes for the stock to actually reflect what you're seeing on the ground. 
And you're saying the, the research and all of that's been eviscerated. Is that because of the bear market in oil that we had in 2015 at that sort of period? Or is it to do with the ESG and this whole move against fossil fuels? Uh, both. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, do you find um, on the ESG side, uh, I mean, do, do you find that there's been a change over the last, say, six, seven months around investors coming back into the energy space, given, you know, the elevated prices of oil and this recognition that there is a transition phase where you will need fossil fuels? Um, I think it depends on who you're looking at. So I think there's a lot of institutional inertia on the institutional investor side, and there's a lot of sort of um, doubling down and kind of commitment bias and sunk loss uh, sort of psychology where um, many places have decided to not invest out of quasi-religious sort of philosophical motivations, whether they're afraid of their students coming and protesting in front of their endowment offices or whether they're virtue signaling because they run a smaller pension fund and they want to run a bigger one. Um, there's actually been additional divestments from oil and gas in the last month or so. I mean, even in the midst of after Russia invaded Ukraine, right, there are shortages of energy in Europe. And I think it was, was it ING? There was some big uh, Dutch insurance company along with I think they did some do some other financial services and they said they were done in oil and gas they were no longer going to provide insurance and they were withdrawing their investments as well I mean this is happening still today um and, and it's really I mean there's two aspects one is moral right like it's there's a moral aspect where there's uh, people in emerging markets and frontier markets who really need this stuff. And if you're replacing burning dung or burning wood inside with burning, you know, propane or natural gas, your life is dramatically improving. Your lifespan is improving. And, you know, even if you're very worried about climate change, you're bringing forward a lot of good where if you're worried about climate change 80 years from now hurting these people, well, you can double their lifespan now by not burning dung indoors in a hut. And if you burn propane indoors instead of dung, you're literally, I mean, you might increase their lifespan by 2x. So if you can do that for a billion people versus worrying about very long dated potential risks, um, I mean, that seems very moral, but then it's also just very uh, non-responsive to economic signals. And so we're not seeing, um, we saw huge equity fund flows last year uh, into the broader market, and we're not really seeing those fund flows in oil and gas. So it's been, I don't know, it's been very interesting. I mean, we've done extraordinarily well and in, like institutions we're divesting from bison and they're not calling. And it's like, okay, well, like if you're not calling us, <laughs> like, and we see our competitors and so I mean, it's just not, um, not happening. And it's very, again, it's unfortunate. It's tragic for a giant number of people who really could use this stuff. And the more expensive it is, um, the, the worse it is from just, uh, you know, uh, overall, like the world is worse off because of it. And many poor people are worse off, but it's also just very strange. I don't think I understand, or may, I'm maybe becoming more cynical about the mandates for these institutional investors, because it doesn't seem to be to, Make the make humanity better, and it doesn't seem to be to maximize profits. So, if it's not either of those, what are they doing? Yeah, yeah, and it, and it seems like they're falling back into having to fire up coal stations and things like that, you know, to meet short term sort of demand. So, there's all sorts of contradictions that are going on here. Now, what, one question I did have, you know, around recent events is that many politicians, for example, and again, lay people have just said, why can't we just crank up the output? You know, like the U.S. has lots of you know, inventory and and capacity. You know, why 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 don't the shell guys come back up and ramp up? You know, production. Why don't the Middle East uh, do the same? The Saudis and the Emiratis and so on and the Gulf countries. Uh, so, what's what's stopping this increase in production? You know, there was a uh, politician. I think it was a congresswoman uh, who was interviewed on CNBC recently, mm. and uh, she was talking about how oil companies are earning excess profits and how this is wrong. She also uh, was on a group that uh, tried to ban fracking in the U.S. last year, and has been recently commenting about how she is anti-fracking and doesn't want oil companies to drill more in the U.S. 
And so the CNBC host correctly asked her, hey, how can you be in favor of more oil production, but anti-fracking? And she said, oh, no, no, you don't understand, essentially. And I'm paraphrasing. You don't understand. These companies can produce more. I don't want them to frack. I just want them to produce more. And so the level of ignorance, I mean, that production is coming from drilling more wells and hydraulic fracture stimulating those wells and bringing them onto production. So uh, again, I mean, that's kind of on the extreme end of either either ignorance or, you know, intentional kind of disinformation. But in the context of that sort of thing, I mean, you know, you pick Congresswoman, right? You either want your constituents to pay $20 a gallon for gasoline or you want there to be more jobs in the U.S. through drilling and completing wells, and uh, you know you need to have drilling and fracking. You can't have it's it's an either or, and I think there's just not. I mean, I can say this a thousand times, and they'll still say it, right? Like it doesn't, it kind of doesn't matter. So my take is, okay, I say what I can, right? I make more money from them being dumb and implementing bad policies. So, but I don't want to. I'd rather make an appropriate amount of money and do well through investing in high quality companies at low valuations um, and have good energy policy. So I say what I think is right and good from a policy perspective while understanding that the inertia and trajectory is towards worse and worse policy, which means my stuff will do even better um, than it would if there was rational policy. Yeah, um, I, I, a couple of things I you know, wanted to ask there. Um, you know, so given that there's been this kind of anti-fracking and just anti-energy company policy towards many companies in the US and, and of course Europe and elsewhere, um, you know, is there a case that the, the regulatory environment is just so kind of uncertain, you know, that energy companies are thinking, hang on, why should we necessarily increase production? Because, you know, we, we could start to and then suddenly the, the tables could turn and it could be a problem for us. I mean, how, how much of this kind of regulatory uncertainty and this, this sort of flip-flopping that's been going on is, is a problem for energy companies? It's a huge problem. They're all thinking about it. I talk to companies all the time. I hosted a Twitter space. It was kind of funny because there was all this sort of like nonsense going on. Um, there was even a, a Dallas Fed survey where they published something. I think they like were very careful about the questions they asked. So as an economist, you get trained in ignoring surveys and observing behavior, right? You want to care about purchase behavior, not what people say. And one of the problems with looking at what people say, especially in responses to surveys, is that you can construct a survey with certain questions and you can literally get the opposite result depending on how you structure the questions. And, you know, People won the Nobel Prize in economics for this, right? A lot of behavioral economics, they observe kind of if you frame something one way versus framing it the other way, you get opposite results. So uh, many people have been citing this Dallas Fed survey, which again, from what I can tell, was totally wrong. Like it was just like misrepresentative. And many people will show this chart and say, oh, well, on the left side of the chart, there's the big bar that says that it's people saying they want to return cash to shareholders. And the small bar is that they're worried about policy. The reality is that they're all worried about policy and that it's really hard because even if you weren't worried about policy, which they are, every executive that I've talked to is concerned about additional negative policy, which is real. I mean, the regulators are ramping up, like the SEC is now increasing their uh, disclosure requirements, which may then be used, that information may be used to pursue these companies in court and tax them more and other stuff. So the regulatory burden is jumping higher right now, like it's in review right now by the SEC. Um, it's in a review period, it's about to get implemented. So it's getting way worse right now. Um, so they're worried about it. Even if they weren't, the negative rhetoric by politicians in the media against the oil and gas industry is making recruiting talent extremely difficult, right? If you're a young person leaving university and the president of the United States says this industry is going away, why on earth would you choose to enter that industry? The problem is it's kind of like that Congresswoman's misunderstanding if you, <laughs> if you say it's terrible, but then you say, why aren't you doing more? Mm -hmm. Well, there's people, capital, and equipment that, you know, it costs money, you have to have the stuff, and you have to have the people. If you're telling the people not to go do it, and then you're preventing the capital directly or indirectly from doing it, and you're regulating the application of the capital such that you're raising the cost of that capital significantly, of course, you're going to have less of it. I mean, that's not that's econ 101 right you raise the yeah. cost of something you reduce the provision of the thing 
that's it. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, how much has the pandemic impacted the supply side of, of, of energy? Because that's, that's the other thing that often comes up. Um, I mean, we were getting into an energy shortage period in January of 2020. And so it made the pandemic much more uh, psychologically challenging for me and for other oil and gas investors and executives. And I think it's actually part of why there's so little capital available still and part of why, um, why the industry got so eviscerated. So people had held on for years and th there were way fewer people in oil and gas in early 2020 than there were in 2014. But there was a set of funds, a set of companies the, the industry could have kind of rebounded pretty significantly and would have. With the pandemic, you ended up with shockingly low oil prices. You even had a negative oil print for a day, which gets talked about a lot, but oil was like $20 a barrel for months. And that, that really has a dampening effect. Many funds closed down or they shifted. So many oil and gas private equity funds became energy transition funds or whatever. <laughs> and um, and you can't walk that back. You go tell all your limited partners, hey, I'm raising a billion dollars to go do this other thing. You can't use that billion dollars to go drill oil and gas. And once you've rebranded to this other thing, it's really hard to go back to raising money for traditional uh, oil and gas development. So you had a huge shift further during the pandemic in a period where there was already going to be undersupply. So demand shocked down in a period where you had this multi-year underinvestment kicking in. And so it looked like for a little while that the industry was going to reset lower and instead, and prices were going to reset lower. But the reality was that this long-term underinvestment kicked in way sooner than people thought, um, especially because of the underinvestment during the pandemic. And so um, I guess it was kind of this like long-term trend plus a shock ending up with something that, um, you know, that we were essentially betting on, but got very lonely. And, um, you know, I think people went from thinking we were contrarian to thinking we were absolutely crazy. And here we are. Yeah, I guess the bison mentality helped, I guess, in the end. So, and, and in terms of uh, global supply chain issues, I mean, are there problems in securing uh, equipment and parts and so on in the uh, oil and gas sector? Yeah, but it's less related to the general uh, supply chain kind of post-COVID thing and more related to the whole value chain in oil and gas getting eviscerated over the last eight years. And so um, it's less of a, hey, there's not enough trucks or not enough boats or whatever to ship this stuff. And a lot more of, hey, the companies that used to be able to make more drill bits can't. They repurpose those factories or they close them. Uh, the companies that could make more drilling pipe or more X, Y, Z other stuff, they're just not, they don't have that capacity because they rationalized it over a long down cycle. And so this is why you have long up cycles after long down cycles, because it takes a really long time. You have to essentially either build new factories or retool old ones. You have to acquire the talent, which again is increasingly difficult. You have to find the capital and there's almost no capital for any of this. So for all of that to happen, you need much higher prices and you need it not to be temporary. You need it to be for a long time. So this is something I fight a lot in terms of sentiment. There are many people that say, oh, well, oil's high, now it's gonna crash. And it's like, well, wait a second. If you look at the history of oil and gas and you look at what's happened after long down cycles, you've almost never seen a long down cycle lead to a short up and then everything goes away. You much more often see that long down cycles lead to long up cycles, almost like the biblical seven years of famine, seven years of feast. Um, there, that's, and it's not, it's not just a psychological thing. It's actually, there are lots of physical impediments but the psychological kind of fallacy of fighting the last war um, is so hard for people to overcome. And so they, they really go from, okay, I mean, you saw this with the just general market after the financial crisis, right? Like in 2009, I was at a family office, everyone was pitching us these short only funds. Hey, like, you know, there was this rebound, but everything's going to crash. And it sounded really sexy really compelling. And then in 2010, sounded really sexy. So leave the family office still like seeing all this stuff. Oh yeah, like this thing is going to crash and that thing. And that continued. I mean, 
there are still people who have been bearish <laughs> since 2009. And most of them are out of business, but some of them are still around. I think that's happening with oil and gas, where you have people who were bearish and wrong in 2020, uh, after the, the worst of the pandemic, and then they've been wrong in 2021, and now they're wrong. And I think there's just this momentum. And sure, there could be an economic crisis. Things could trade down temporarily from a commodity price and equity price perspective. But I think there is this long trend up and a lot of it's driven by the supply chain, but it's really, it's not, it's not the COVID supply chain that's the issue. It's that the value chain was eviscerated. And I mean, it's still not, we're still not seeing investment. So you need this investment, you need it to get funded and start, and then it takes multiple years and then you have more capacity. And we're not even seeing that start. And, uh, you know, uh Outside of the US, I mean, are there other places where you are seeing investment? So the Middle East, is there investment going on there? I mean, can they, could they meaningfully increase their capacity? You know, people talk about Iran coming back online, Venezuela, perhaps. I'm just trying to understand like where there's potential positives on the supply side. Yeah, so, so um, you can, I'm not a peak oil person. I'm more of a peak cheap oil person. So okay. um, there's, there's plenty of oil for a long time. And there's plenty of natural gas. There's even more natural gas for a long time from a world perspective. Um, and there's enough to be able, and that's like what really gets me, there's enough for the quality of life of the poorest people in the world, the poorest 2 billion people in the world to improve dramatically if we adequately supplied them. And we need the regulatory kind of certainty and we need to be rewarded instead of punished for doing it. But there is really, there is this plenty, it's just expensive and it needs to be encouraged and not discouraged. So um, when you look around the world, the rig counts are still really low and the service capacity has been eviscerated worldwide. It's not just eviscerated in the US and Canada. So um, I don't know, I mean, you, you have Saudi Arabia saying they're gonna raise their spare capacity by a million barrels a day. Um, there's no evidence that they have the spare capacity that they claim right now. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that they don't. So what exactly do they mean by, by raising that capacity? They are drilling more natural gas wells and they burn a lot of their oil for power. So it's possible that they replace some of the oil they've been burning for power with natural gas and then export more oil. The problem is that their natural gas is incredibly expensive. I know many people that have been hired from the shale gas industry here in the US to go to Saudi Arabia to drill shale gas wells there. It's hard and it takes a lot of water, which and you kind of need fresh water for it. And Saudi Arabia <laughs> doesn't have an abundance of fresh water and fracking a well there. I mean, I don't know, like there's activity in Oman too. A well that would cost, let's say, $6 million in the US might cost 30 or $40 million in Oman or Saudi wow. Arabia. Okay, so it's multiples Literally. higher. Yeah, yeah. So it's really, I think, yeah, they have the capacity, they have the, the rock, but just because you have that doesn't mean that it's getting developed. And again, I think we're actually seeing... we're we're still burning the furniture. There's still so little development that you're actually reducing your capacity still at current levels right now, April, 2022. So you actually need to build more stuff to be able to ramp up just to supply the world for demand today. Then you need to build more in order to supply the world for demand in 2025 or 2030. And you're just not that construction isn't happening yet. You have drilling companies at half of book value and steel costs are higher. And, you know, there's not the factories to be able to build the stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think it's quite, it's quite challenging and we're, we're not, we're not even starting. And then the one other thing on that is exploration. So you need to find the stuff that you're going to delineate and then develop. You need to find the fields. And in many cases, um, there has not been, I think from a global perspective, we're producing 10 times as much oil as we're discovering on an annual basis. And that's been happening. I mean, the, the real big exploration push kind of slowed down in 2012. And so we've been under investing in exploration for a long time. So that means that all the other activity other than exploration is to some extent burning the furniture. We're, we're working through from a value chain perspective, we're working through the working capital and that looks good, right? And like Congress might say, oh, you're over earning, but <laughs> we're under earning and we're under earning because 
what you want to see for a healthy market to balance is you want to see exploration sufficient to discover more than 100% of your consumption, not 12% of your consumption. And we're just not seeing that activity ramp up. So again, it's like, I know I keep saying we're not seeing it, but we're not, the early, the early stages of a recovery require uh, from a supply perspective, require investment and activity that's not happening. And so the, all the other stuff, it's noise and we're just not solving, we're not starting to solve the problem. And I think from a government perspective, the idea is, hey, we have these alternative energy policies. We have all this other stuff. We're going to, we don't need that. By the time that becomes an issue, it's not going to be necessary. And I guess my pushback is, hey, let's look at France and Germany and other countries that made the investment that the US and others are starting to talk about making. And they're not in a position where they can move off of these hydrocarbons. They're actually more dependent on them than people thought. So I think I think it's a policy error and it's leading to um, a potential. I mean, it seems likely at this point that we're in a multi-year bull market for oil and gas. And at the same time, the sentiment is, oh, it's topped, it's done, commodities are over. And it's like, okay, well, this is the shortest commodity cycle in history, if that's true, and very, very unlikely. I mean, in terms of the oil price, say WTI or crude or Brent, I mean, do you think we could get, say, 200 or so? You know, um, is, is that a reasonable sort of level that we could reach? I think we have to. I think yeah. we have to. I mean, we're just not seeing, we saw oil at, I think WTI got to what, like 125, almost 130 recently yeah. when there was concern that Russia was going to get shut off completely. And then, you know, it it bounced around there, it spiked a couple of times, and now it's back down below 100. Um, the problem is you just look at the activity at $100 oil. And we're now, we've been at 100 or above now for a few months. And it looks like we're probably going to be kind of in that range for a little while here. It's hard to predict the future, but kind of we're in this range. Um, what we're seeing in this range is not enough of this sort of base level activity that you need to rebuild the industry's supply capacity. And so I think you need much higher prices, whatever price you start seeing exploration wells drilled much more frequently and rig building factories retooled to actually build rigs and pressure pumping oriented, you know, uh, fabricators or whatever. I, I'm using factories as kind of a general, right? There's specific terms for these, but just the manufacturing capacity to make these things, you're just not seeing them. When you start seeing that, that maybe is an indicator that you're getting closer to an oil price that makes sense. But even then you need them to be built. <laughs> so you need the fabrication and manufacturing built and then you need more of it built, and then you need it to run for a while to replace all the stuff that broke, and then you need more stuff. And so, again, just from a very pure widget perspective, you need the widgets that make the widgets, and we're not making those first ones, and we're not even fixing the factories that make those first widgets to make the second widgets to get the third widgets. So um, it's a kind of classic um, economic cycle problem, and we're still, I mean, <laughs> This, I mean, measured in that perspective, we're maybe second inning where the prices are starting to rise because we're in a problem and we're just not getting that investment to, to make those widgets. No, that's a really good point. So what you're saying there is that the, looking at the price alone is deceptive uh, about whether we're at a high or not. You have to look at the underlying fundamentals and whether there's the investment and the production and everything coming online to be able to generate that additional supply. Because if there isn't, then the fundamentals aren't there for this peak oil price to occur. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm glad. This is actually one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you. I've seen some of your interviews, and I think you do a good job of kind of distilling some of the <laughs> sort of macro. There's all this noise and lots of things that people toss around, and I think you do a good job of distilling. And I think that was a really good observation, right? It's really, it's just like, it's not just about price, it's about activity. And, you know, there's a lot of different inputs to get to an output which seems desired, which is lower oil prices, and that may require much higher prices for some meaningful amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. And and what's your take on, on Russia then in terms of its oil supply? So obviously Europe hasn't imposed sanctions on energy yet. Uh, it may well do soon. I mean, they've done some sanctions on coal, but obviously there's an aversion to touching Russian entities. So there's something going on there. I mean, how do you view something like that? I mean, there's such an unusual event. But Russia is one of the biggest producers in the world, and for them to, you know, come under this this new kind of regime, uh, you know, what does this all? I mean, how do you interpret that for your sector? 
So I've been just underwriting continued production from Russia uninterrupted. And I understand that's probably wrong. There's probably some amount of oil disruption, uh, oil production capacity and oil export disruption from Russia. So all of that, from my perspective, is just upside to price and upside in terms of drained inventories elsewhere in the world. Um, it's There's so much bad news and news flow and so much kind of incorrect information out there on a variety of fronts right now that I feel a little bit like I'm operating as like a pilot on instruments instead of a pilot able to look out the window. And so when you're operating in that sort of cloud of uncertainty, one of the ways to address it is to try to block out what you see in the window, because you might see something, but just because you see it doesn't mean that it's as real as it's represented. And this infuriates people. I think more than people are upset about being bullish early in a commodity cycle um, after a, a move, but again, relative to what we talked about, still very early, um, they hate even more taking information. You know, I'll acknowledge it, maybe I'll tweet it or something, but like it doesn't, it's not, it's not the core of the thesis. So maybe Russian disruption happens, maybe it doesn't. Maybe Iranian production comes online, maybe it doesn't. Um, maybe Venezuelan production starts to rebound. And again, both Iran and Venezuela are very complicated. They would take many years to bring on production. And frankly, I wish them well. I hope that they come on and I hope that their economies boom. And in my analysis, especially with Venezuela, I see the potential, and actually, I mean, Iran is pretty close. I see the potential for such a substantial economic boom in those places to the extent that they move towards a free market, that they may actually end up consuming more oil incrementally than they incrementally produce, at least for a number of years. And so I don't think, I mean, you look at the, was it tens or hundreds of millions of people in Iran and Venezuela, and you look at the former state of their economy and how oil intensive it was, I don't see that as a threat to the oil market. And I also see it as a very potential positive just to all of those millions of people who live in those places. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a digression. The, the, the main point is, I think it's really hard to tell. Obviously, if Russian oil production comes off, it's going to be very hard for it to come back on. The reservoirs there are very complicated. Service companies have been moving out. They're not totally out, and the announcements are somewhat deceptive. They're still providing services in some, in some capacity. There's still some activity and development in Russia. Um, our view had been already previously, starting kind of middle of the year last year, and uh, we started sharing this, that OPEC plus had been running out of spare capacity. And Russia was one of the few places that had a little bit of extra capacity left. So, you know, maybe they have less and maybe that starts to get degraded, maybe not. That part, again, is unclear, but it kind of, that's kind of the, the, the tree and the forest is this sort of global underinvestment for a decade plus in exploration, global underinvestment in production for the last five years plus and, you know, demand rising on a 1% plus annual basis as a long-term multi-decade trend. And they're all, all really, really good points. And it's important to kind of remind people of the structural story here, because I think, again, as you said, uh, it's easy for people to dismiss these things as, as temporary spikes in oil. When Russia eases up, then somehow there'll be a correction. But you rightly point out there's something deeper going on here. Now, I did want to ask about China and China's role in the energy sector. I mean, are they still, I mean, are they providing equipment and services in the oil sector because they may have different goals or I mean they've talked a lot about climate change themselves and so maybe they're scaling back themselves but how how how's China influenced the energy market because obviously they're probably one of the biggest consumers in the world um so so there's there's two questions with China one is their demand and then one is their ability to provide services uh worldwide in the oil and gas uh sector so on the demand, it's even worse than kind of global demand. Like imagine your instruments are unreliable because there's some electrical issue <laughs> and you can't see out the window. So uh, TBD, right? I think okay. uh, I think the Chinese regime has a lot of incentive for people's uh, quality of life in China to improve incrementally over time. That's how they stay in power. The deal with a totalitarian state is that you, on one hand, uh, have all the political power. On the other hand, you need to have a large majority of the people 
with their lives improved in some capacity on an annual basis or else they have a violent revolution or some other sort of thing. It's the, the long history of, of these sorts of states. And so generally that's productive, not necessarily for iron ore, not necessarily for various other commodities, but oil and natural gas are very much necessary and uranium and certain other commodities very necessary for that progression for them to stay in power and they are laser focused on staying in power. And so I think there's alignment and there's lots of mess and noise and various things that they're doing to stay in power. But the biggest thing they're doing is slowly improving their GDP per capita, which is highly oil intensive based on where they're at from a development state. In terms of their ability to deliver effective oil services worldwide, um, <laughs> I'll just politely say that's the bull case is <laughs> you replace the Halliburtons with XYZ Chinese services company in Russia, for example, uh, that makes me more bullish on oil, not less. Uh, I've seen a few of these projects. I mean, there's a movie I cite sometimes, Syriana, where they show a oh, yeah. Chinese firm coming in. And I mean, you look at the number of people applied to a project, and then you look at the uh, development of that project. And it's not that and, and you know, I guess I have to caveat, this isn't something that I'm not saying that Chinese people are not capable, obviously, right? All people, all people are capable. Um, it's a function of corporate culture. It's a function of government intervention in the management of companies. It's a question of sort of innovation cultures within companies. And then the reality of increasingly difficult to find and extract oil resulting in um, the need for innovative companies with new technology, with highly motivated and aligned people and Chinese corporate culture today, from what I can tell, as well as observing projects that Chinese services companies have been highly involved with. Um, it doesn't seem like there's a good, it's a kind of square peg round hole sort of thing. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, they don't really have their own large sort of oil and gas sector for them to build up their expertise either, unlike, say, the US or, or Russia. Um, I, I did want to ask about, you know, the types of investments that you're making in this bull market scenario. You know, a basic question, and, and this I'm speaking as a non-specialist, is why not just buy oil, you know, oil futures? You know, why, you know, is, is that simply the best way of playing this? You know, why... Um, why look at oil fuel services and all of these other sorts of things? Because isn't it just a play on, on oil price uh, itself? I mean, it's a great question. And, you know, there are great macro investors who are just long out, long dated uh, oil futures and or options. And I'm not saying that won't do well, but it does appear that there are better returns available through owning equities that are very levered to improvements in oil prices. And so you might think you have a lot of leverage through futures or through options on futures. And options on futures are very highly levered, but you also have a lot of timing risk and you also have, um, you're essentially betting on prices on the forward curve today. If you look at what's priced into a lot of the oil equities on the producer side, it's kind of easier to explain on the producers. The services are, are more complicated, which again is, I think, partly why they're not attracting as much capital. So I won't try to explain that. I'll just <laughs> focus on the producers. So the average producer right now is pricing in per various different investment bank reports, pricing in about $60 WTI oil in the U.S., and in Canada and pricing in about, let's say 250 to maybe 275 per MCF natural gas. And so you look at the forward curve and you try to make a bet that's equivalent to a levered producer that earns that where their cash flow increases very disproportionate to an increase in the commodity price. And you know, on the natural gas side, it's even more egregious because there's contango instead of backwardation. So the forward price for gas is actually higher, whereas the forward price for oil is low, lower. Um, but you look at how much money these guys make at different prices. And then you look at historic valuations and one, you have a catch up on historic valuations. So the producers are trading at lower multiples um, than they did historically, despite higher margins than they had historically. So you have kind of this nice setup relative to just spot pricing and relative to the forward curve. As the forward curve improves, their cash flows improve dramatically. 
And then when you look at where the capital is going, so dividends are complicated because they're just kind of giving the money back to investors, but companies that are paying down debt improve their cost of capital because they become intrinsically less risky. So those companies that are most actively using their extra cash flow from oil being at 95 or 100 or whatever today to pay down debt are increasing their likely multiple in the future because the market assigns a risk. Generally, it's been about every dollar spent on debt pay down gets you $2 or so in market cap over time. Just as, again, the risk associated with the, uh, with the market cap diminishes substantially as you have less and less debt. When you go from over-levered to under-levered, the, the transformation in market value, which is a lot of where I've seen success, um, is dramatic. Secondarily, if you are at a very cheap valuation on a cash flow basis and you use your cash flow to repurchase stock aggressively, you can compound money very rapidly by doing that. And again, that's been very underappreciated. Certain value investors uh, are focused on that. You know, Charlie Munger has talked about it a lot, but it's not something that's well appreciated, partly because corporate buybacks have such bad reputations for different reasons. And so if you're early in a commodity cycle, this is like partly why it's important to be able to understand what's happening from a multi-year perspective. If you're early on, people pressure you a lot to buy back to not actually buy back shares. They pressure you to pay dividends, um, citing T. Boone Pickens or certain other people that that was their strong preference in a, a different world at the end of a commodity cycle instead of the beginning. Um, and then they pressure you to pay down debt, which again is good. But if you can really get in a position where you're retiring a large number of your shares in a rising commodity price environment while you're keeping your production relatively flat within cash flow, you can end up compounding a lot. So you look at that setup compared to owning the futures. If the forward curve just stays where it's at, you could potentially earn a five times or 10 times sort of return owning a kind of average or slightly cheaper than average oil producer equity or oil and gas producer equity versus losing all your money owning the future because it just doesn't, you, you, you buy the option on the future and the option expires worthless. So you really need the price to go up a lot in the case where you, it goes up a lot, that sort of base return for a producer increases dramatically, especially for the ones that are paying off debt, buying back stock, or compounding through production growth. And, and do you sort of neutralize the equity beta when you make these holdings? Because obviously these, whatever stock you buy will have a beta to the S&P or, or whichever sort of index you look at. And so if overall stocks go down, then you'll be hit by that. So... No, and there's there's reasons for that. Uh, partly, uh, I found that, and this is partly from looking at returns before going into professional investment management, as well as at a multi-billion dollar family office where I was involved in allocating money out to other managers, as well as doing principal investments. Um, long, short managers tend to do quite poorly on their long investments relative to long only managers. Uh, it's it's Buffett's secret to some extent, right? It's basically yeah. float plus not really messing around too much with market timing. You know, he does a little bit and tries to make sure he's not buying at the end of cycles or whatever, uh, but and is very valuation sensitive. But you look at kind of where Buffett focused, where various other phenomenal value investors focused, and it's much less on market beta and much more on being right about particular opportunities. Um, that being said, market beta could actually play out very favorably to the extent that commodity prices do well over time and the market stays undersupplied. Because if you're a producer at, let's say, three times free cash flow right now on an enterprise value basis, and you're taking 30% of your free cash flow and buying back stock, so essentially you're retiring a little more than 10%, let's say you're just retiring 10% of your stock every year. Well, if your commodity price falls a little, your stock falls a lot for a year, right? Let's say it's down 50%, which is not unreasonable. A lot of these stocks are very volatile. If you can retire your stock at half the price, let's say you retire 20% of your shares in a year instead of 10%, your snowball builds way faster. And so there is volatility as an investor in the space. I mean, <laughs> we're named bison, we right? face into the storm. Um, we put out a white paper in December called Embracing Volatility, explaining why we bought stock in November, even though there had been a run because there was a big pullback as people got scared. Um, I think you have to 
in order to earn exceptional returns, it's necessary to accept an amount of volatility that is considered impolite as uh, you know an institutional kind of long short manager. And you know, again, I think that's part of where um, this has been less of a fit and part of what's kind of pulled public equity capital away. Ironically, a lot of that capital has gone into tech VC or like tech growth funds yeah. or the tire globals of the world, which have imploded because the reality was that volatility was always there. It was just hidden based on mark to model instead of mark to market. And so um, ironically, a lot of the funds that were seeking quiet and were seeking steady compounded returns um, that didn't exist. It was fake. And now we're seeing those allocators facing the consequences of pursuing stability. So I, I just embrace the volatility. I understand the question. And again, might have, maybe I was a long answer to a short question, but I think really there's a big advantage in being able to say, hey, I care about earning a multiple times return over the next five years. And yeah, it's going to be painful. Yeah, I hate giving back money in the sense of a uh, down month or down year. But you know, if I can see where I'm getting to and I see the path, and I understand that there's going to be significant road bumps along the way. Instead of trying to guess when those road bumps happen and somehow um, getting blown up and getting on those guesses, I'd rather just have the exposure, take extra exposure where I can when a road bump happens, and then potentially get to return capital once I get to where I'm trying to get to. Okay, yeah, that's very clear. And what's what's your biggest focus this year? I mean, where where are your eyes set, say for the next six to twelve months? Um, so a little bit on Canadian producers, where um, many of them are producing natural gas, which has uh, gone back into vogue to some extent in the U.S. And I think people forget that there's a little bit of this like whip effect, where the U.S. gas market is kind of the um, the handle for the whip, it's kind of the, the more substantial part and Canadian natural gas is the is the tail of the whip. And so the, the tail really moves a lot when the US market moves. And so you have these US producers up a lot and the Canadian producer stocks are up, but I think people don't understand just how big of an impact there is on natural gas and then on natural gas liquids, which then affect the oil market and affect realization. So there's this happening along with currency effects where Canada is very poorly managed from a fiscal perspective. And so the Canadian dollar is doing very poorly, which is amazing if you're a producer of a non-Canadian dollar denominated product tied into a non-Canadian dollar denominated economy um, and you're an exporter of that product with most of your costs denominated in Canadian dollars. I mean, this is, we're actually working on a white paper right now on this currency effect. So you have this uh, market that people don't understand along with the currency effect. So a lot of focus on that. And then a lot of focus on oil services, just kind of catching these inflections that it doesn't seem like many are around to even notice or work on. Okay, that's great. Now, um, I did want to ask a few personal questions as well, because we've covered a lot of ground, uh, you know, on the energy sector, we could carry on for a while, but I, I did want to round off some personal questions. The, the first one was, what, what's, the best pers what's the best investment advice you've ever received? Um, that's a great question. I think, I think the best advice I got was to figure out what you're going to do and do it and not not let the noise distract you. It was from my dad and it was after the oil price crash in 2014. And, you know, I think it just, it, 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 I don't remember exactly how you worded it, but it was something along those lines. And, you know, obviously I took that to heart and it felt really dumb for a while. And I think there's a lot of truth to, if you can figure out what's going to happen, you have to, I think, have that exposure to win from it. And you just have to set yourself up in a way where you have the longevity to be able to express that and to be able to economically benefit from it. That's great. And uh, you presumably you must be overwhelmed with information like we all are. Um, I mean, do you have a system or some kind of productivity hacks you use to just keep on top of things? Um, kind of. So what, what we do, I mean, we're constantly gathering good 
uh, positive indicators as well as good contrary indicators. Uh, really, the, the best the best system that I've come up with, and you know, there's lots of different sort of organizational things, but but really like heuristic high level. The, the simplest thing that I can recommend to other people to do that I've done that's worked well is notice who does well over multiple years. Like notice who the best investors you can find are, not from 50 years ago, but like who's doing well now and who's done well over the last number of years and what are they finding interesting? What are they focused on? And trying to, to notice that and prioritize that over whatever the headlines are or kind of famous analysts or whatever. And so um, allocating time and focus and energy to ideas from people that do well, and some of it's the kind of uh, Napoleon's like find me lucky generals thing. Um, so some of it might be luck, but hey, that's interesting too. And maybe a, I guess you'd call it a momentum factor or whatever. Um, and then some of it's going to be just brilliance that might not yet be as well understood. And so that's a, just because they're doing something doesn't mean I'll do it, but it definitely means that I'll pay attention to it. And I think other people should do that. And it's a little frustrating when um, I see many people get excited about an idea or an analysis or a headline from a source that has a very poor track record. It's like, okay, that's nice. I mean, I don't really care and I understand that's human psychology, but just because someone has a degree or is on TV or did well historically, whatever, it doesn't make their that idea necessarily even worth allocating a meaningful amount of time. Yep, yep. I, I hear you. I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I see you have a number of books behind you. Um, I, I, yeah, I always ask guests this, you know, what, what are some of the books that have really influenced you? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I disagree with T. Boone, at least for this part of the cycle, <laughs> on the dividends over um, uh, over buybacks, uh, you know, later in the cycle, I think he's right. Uh, but I liked the first billion is the hardest. I thought that was really oh, yeah. interesting. And um, I really liked Einhorn's uh, fooling some of the people all of the time. Um, his book about allied capital and kind of how that happened. And uh, I keep this uh, uh, momentum. Uh, a friend sent me this. I have the, the gas uh, station, the Amaranth uh, gas pump okay. <laughs> uh, as a reminder of humility. And so I think the, the Einhorn thing is important. I think the T Boone stories are important and, you know, keeping kind of physical things. It's easy to talk about. It's hard to really, remember, especially in the early stages of a recovery where returns are phenomenal and you, you feel like a genius, um, you know, genius does fail and it's really important to kind of anchor yourself. And so those have been books and stories that have really helped me stay focused on, um, on what I'm doing without hopefully blowing up. Great. That's great. And um, how can people follow you? Um, so uh, my website, uh, bisoninterest.com, as well as uh, on Twitter, uh, we post probably a little too actively, uh, Josh underscore young underscore one uh, on Twitter. So either of those, we put out a monthly update on the market on the website. You can sign up if you want. No, that's great. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep a note of those links on, on the show notes as well. Um, so with that, I mean, thanks a lot. It was, it was super informative to, to listen to you. Very kind of eye-opening, especially for, for non-specialists uh, like myself. So, so once again, thanks a lot for, for your excellent conversation. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it.